Hello friends. This is the fourth lecture in the chest imaging series. In this lecture, we shall discuss about the lateral chest radiograph. So I'll be discussing about the normal radiological structures in lateral chest radiograph and also highlight upon how to read or interpret the same. So let's begin. So in assessing a lateral chest radiograph, we are going to address three main questions. Why, what and how. First and foremost question, why do you need a lateral chest radiograph? So I'll give you two examples. In this frontal radiograph, you can see that there is some opacity in the right lower lung zones. So we don't know what it is and where it is located. So if you have a lateral chest radiograph as shown here, you can see that there is a wedge-shaped radio opacity in the region overlying the heart. So this makes it simple. So we know that it is a pathology involving the middle lobe because it is overlying the heart shadow. And due to its wedge-shaped appearance, it's likely due to collapse. So that solves the problem. Secondly, again, you have another frontal radiograph where you can see there is some pathology in the right lower lung zone. So comparing to the previous radiograph, you can see that it appears similar to the example shown before. But if you were to carefully observe for other subtle signs, you know that it is not just some consolidation or collapse. It is something more. Anyways, I'm not going to its details, but you have suspicion of some other pathology. And once you get a lateral chest radiograph, you can confirm the same. As you can see that this is the sternum and you can see that it is going inwards. So this is a case of pectus excavator. So these are the basic two indications of lateral chest radiograph to localize the lesion. Where is it located? And secondly, to look at special areas which have not been addressed in the frontal radiograph and thus helping us in diagnosing the same. The next two questions that we are interested in are what is the normal anatomy and how do you read the chest radiograph? We shall see them together in the subsequent slides. Again, if you have a protocol in reading chest radiograph, it becomes simple. It ensures that we have not actually missed any specific areas. So again, we'll go with the algorithm A, B, C, D, E and F. So A standing for airways, B for the blood vessels in the bony cage, C for the cardia and the mediastinum, D for the diaphragm and costophrenic angles, E for everything else, we shall see them in detail later, and finally F for the fissures. So first and foremost, we shall see about the airways. So let's see the pictorial representation given on the left side. As you can see, the trachea is represented by the radiolucent tubular structure in the center. And if you observe carefully, as you go down the trachea, it narrows down or tapers down to a point. So this area shows the site of carina, but you cannot see carina in a lateral chest radiograph. Instead, you can see the takeoff of two airway structure that is the right upper lobe bronchus and the left upper lobe bronchus. These are seen as two radiolucent structures superimposed within the central air column. So the upper one being the right upper lobe bronchus and the lower one being the left upper lobe bronchus or the left main bronchus its distal part. So let's see that in a radiograph. So airways, that is the trachea, represented by the central loosened tubular structure. So as you go down, you can see that it is tapering down to a point. Here you can see two radiolucent structure if you look carefully. This is one and if you more carefully, this is the other one. So I'll mark it out for you again. This is one radiolucent structure and this is the second one. So if you were to observe carefully, the one below as we've already mentioned, which would be the left upper lobe bronchus or the left main bronchus, its distal part, it is more distinct and more clearly outlined. 
because it is surrounded by the vascular structures and making its contrast superior. Whereas the upper one, which forms the right upper lobe bronchus, is seen but little less distinct. So this is the magnified view showing the right upper lobe bronchus and the left upper lobe bronchus. So sometimes the only bronchus that you may see would be the left upper lobe bronchus for the reasons already mentioned. Now coming to the next structure, the mnemonic B which stands for blood vessels and the bony cage. So first about the blood vessels. The two important blood vessels that we're going to assess is one the aorta, two the hilar vessels. So regarding the aorta, you can look carefully and you can see this radio dense tubular curvilinear structure. This is the arch of aorta. And if you were to trace it proximally, this part which merges with the heart shadow here, that forms the ascending aorta. And again, if you were to look carefully, if you can trace it down, you can see the descending aorta here. So in the aorta, look for the normal caliber. Any increase in size, it can be due to neurism. Next, we shall see about the hilar vessels. So again, going back to the pictorial representation, how can you identify the hilar vessels? In the lateral radiograph, there are two important hilar vessels that you can make out. One would be the right pulmonary artery, the other would be the left pulmonary artery. So an easy way to identify is that these vessels can be seen sandwiching the major airways. So we know that this is the major airway, the trachea and the bronchus. And these vessels are seen as radiodense structure. Why radiodense? Because it is filled with blood anteriorly and posteriorly sandwiching the airways. So the right pulmonary artery would be anterior and the left pulmonary artery would be posterior outlining the airway structures. So let's trace them out in the radiograph. So first and foremost you have to localize the airway. So the tubular airway structures, radiolucent structure you can see here and Sandwiching the airway structures, the radiodent structure anteriorly, this area would be the right pulmonary artery. And a clue to see the left pulmonary artery is that, remember, it looks like a miniature form of the arch of iota. See, we know that over here you have the heart, the curvilinear structure here would be the iota, and Paralleling that, the miniature comma-shaped structure here, that would be the left pulmonary artery. So it is comma-shaped, paralleling the aortic arch, but seen posterior to the air column. So what are the things that you have to assess in the hilar vessels? You have to look at the density and the size. So if there is enlargement in the size with increased density without much distortion of the structure, it can be due to vessel enlargement as in pulmonary hypertension. Whereas if the size is enlarged added with added density and a distorted contour, it signifies some lymphadenopathy or a hilar mass lesion. So these are the basic things that you have to look at in the hilum. Now coming to the bony cage. So remember, in lateral radiograph, we're going to emphasize three structures. One is the vertebra, next is the sternum, and the third would be the ribs. We know that in the frontal radiograph, you have to see the vertebrae through the heart shadow. So that makes it very difficult. Whereas in the lateral radiograph, as you can see, these are the vertebrae here. I'll mark it up for you. So you can see the whole contour of the vertebral body, the intervertebral disc space, that is the loosened area between them. So you look at the size, look if there is any collapse, or look if there is obliteration of the disc space. So these can be better assessed only in lateral chest radiograph. Okay, size, contour, and intervertebral disc space. 
Next would be about the sternum. We have already discussed about the importance of looking at sternum in lateral radiograph. So as you can see, here would be the sternum with the manubrium sternum in the upper part and the body below. So you can assess for the contour, you can look for any fractures, you can look for any depression inwards, inward bending which would be the excavatum, the outward bending which would be the carinatum. So as you can see in the figure in the top right corner, the depressed sternum can give a really challenging appearance on the front of radiograph. So you may tend to diagnose it wrongly. Next about the ribs. So ribs are better, always better assessed in frontal radiograph because you can see the full extent of the anterior and the posterior ribs. In lateral radiograph, uh, I'll mark out the ribs for you. You can see these curvilinear structures, okay? These are the ribs. Again, if you look carefully, the one marked in blue, okay? These, is, these are also the ribs. So these represents the right and the left ribs. So why this weighting appearance? Remember, in lateral chest radiograph, you know that by convention, lateral chest radiograph means the left lateral view. So if you were to go back to the previous lecture, lecture number two, where I have described about the projection, going back to the physics of imaging. So if you were to go back to lecture number two regarding the projections, you can know, see that if a structure is farther away from the x-ray tube, that structure appears magnified. So in left lateral chest radiograph, the right-sided structure, the right chest is farther away. So the right-sided ribs will be magnified. So you can see that these enlarged structures from the right ribs, whether the smaller curvilinear structure forms the left ribs. So we have done about the airways, the blood vessels and the burning cage, now going to the cardia. So in heart, there are two things that you have to assess. One is about the uniformity and the second one regarding the contour. So if you were to look carefully, this is the region of heart. So there should be uniform density throughout the cardiac shadow. Any added density signifies pathology. Next about the contour. So in the figure on the left side, you can see the anterior would be the right ventricle and uh, posterior would be the light, left ventricle and more above would be the left atria. So marking it out in the radiograph, the most anterior part is of the heart contour is formed by the right ventricle and further above it is by the right ventricular outflow tract. And posteriorly, the most superior part is formed by the left atria, whereas more inferiorly, near the diaphragm, it is formed by the left ventricle. The importance is that if the right ventricle enlarges, it enlarges anteriorly. So remember, not more than one third of the sternal contour should be opposed by the right ventricle. If it is enlarged, you can see that more of the right ventricle will be opposing the sternum, obliterating this clear space here. Whereas for left atrial or left ventricular enlargement, the enlargement goes or bulges to posteriorly. So this is one of the way you can assess the cardiac chamber enlargement. Again, make a note of this thin curvilinear structure which can be seen or which can be traced from abdomen to the thorax. This forms the shadow of the IVC. So what's its significance? So note that the left ventricle, which forms the posterior lower part of the cardiac contour, its distance from the IVC shall not be more than 1.8 to 2 centimeter roughly. Because if it is more, it means that the left ventricle is enlarged because we know that the left ventricle enlarges in a posterior direction. So the distance between the outer contour of the heart posteriorly with the IVC shadow helps us in diagnosing the left ventricular enlargement. So now we'll go to the next letter D, which stands for diaphragm. As in for frontal radiograph, we can make out between the right and the left side. You can see a curvilinear dense structure all the way from posterior to anterior, whereas another curvilinear dense structure all the way from posterior but stopping short off in the region of cardiac shadow. So the 
right diaphragm is the one which can be traced in its entirety in lateral radiograph from posterior to anterior whereas the left diaphragm will stop short where the heart touches with the diaphragm so this is one of the way we can distinguish between the right and left diaphragm another way would be to look at the stomach bubble here we know that in a normal situs the stomach bubble is on the left side so the diaphragm closely opposing the stomach bubble would be the left hemidiaphragm. So always remember, whenever we are speaking of diaphragm, we have to speak about the costophrenic angles too. So as in frontal radiograph, it should be acute and it should be sharp. Any obliteration signifies an effusion or pleural thickening. And remember, an added advantage of lateral radiograph is to detect very minimal effusion in the order of about 75 ml that is only 75 ml of fluid is required to obliterate the costophrenic angle in lateral chest radiograph whereas in frontal radiograph it requires about 175 to 250 ml to obliterate the costophrenic angle so very subtle effusion early picked up in lateral chest radiograph so we have seen the airways, blood vessels, cardiac diaphragm, now moving to the fissures. So remember in frontal radiograph, we can see normally the minor fissure and the minor fissure is seen only on the right side. And very rarely only we can make out the oblique fissure, usually not seen. Whereas in lateral radiograph, we can make out both minor and major fissure. So remember the anatomy, the major fissure, also known as the oblique fissure, goes obliquely from the D5 vertebra and it terminates somewhere on the diaphragm, several centimeters away from the sternum. And also remember that left hemidiaphragm is steeper. Again, for the minor fissure, as the name suggests, horizontal fissure, you can see the horizontal line at about the level of fourth rib. So in the chest radiograph, you can make out, but sometimes it's very difficult, and it is easily seen in conditions of pleural thickening or pulmonary edema due to fluid in the fissure. So as you can see, the two oblique fissure here, the left major fissure, it is more steeper. It comes and touches the diaphragm several centimeters away from the sternum, and again, the right one, which is less steep, and also the minor fissure horizontally running and touching against major fissure. What is the significance? Let's see. It helps us in localizing the lobes and thus localizing the lesions. So as it is evident from the figure, this is the major fissure. Any lung field posterior would be the lower lobe, both right and the left. Similarly, any part of the lung anterior to the major fissure would be the left upper lobe. But this is not the case with the right upper lobe because we know that there is a minor fissure which is separating the right upper lobe and the middle lobe. So for right upper lobe, anything anterior to the major fissure and above the minor fissure forms the right upper lobe. Whereas the middle lobe is delineated by the minor fissure above and posteriorly it is limited by the major fissure and anteriorly the sternal surface. So this helps us in knowing the lobes and thus localizing lesion to the lobes. So if you have observed carefully, in the mnemonic, we have skipped E, the everything else. We shall see them separately. So everything else stands for three dark regions, dark or loosened regions and a sign. So the three dark areas, one would be the retrosternal space, Two would be the retrocardiac space. The three would be the retrotracheal space. Retrosternal, retrocardiac, retrotracheal or the radar triangle. And finally, about the spine sign. First, let's take retrosternal clear space. So this region behind the sternum and anterior to the heart and the major vessel that forms the retrosternal area. To anatomically correlate, let's have a look at the CT image given here. So the retral sternal space represents the area of contact of the right and the left lung and the intervenous mediastinal fat between. 
So this area is normally loosened. So any increase in the loosency or any opacity signifies pathology. Loosency can be seen in conditions like overinflation of lung, the emphysema, whereas opacity can be due to any mediastinal mass lesion like anterior mediastinal mass lesion or it can be due to the enlargement of the right ventricular outflow tract or the right ventricle per se obliterating the spacia. So these are few of the causes of vitrosternal opacity. Next we shall see about the retrocardiac area. Similarly behind the heart there is a loosened area here. Okay this is the area occupied by both the lung uh, opposed together so any lung lesion can bring an opacity here or similarly as discussed above as discussed previously the enlarged right ventricle can bring out an opacity here so this region is also important now coming to the next area which is the radius triangle so radius triangle is also known as the retrotracheal space so let's delineate its border Anteriorly, it's formed by the posterior wall of the trachea. So we know that this is the region of trachea. So anteriorly, it's the posterior border of trachea. Posteriorly, it is formed by the vertebral body. So you can see here, these are the vertebrae. And inferiorly, it is bound by the aortic arch. So aortic knuckle goes here like this. And superiorly, it, the, it is the thoracic inlet. So it's roughly a triangular space like this. And it is normally loosened. Its shape varies according to the patient habitus. So this area is marked by the opposition of the two lungs and the intervening mediastinum between them. So it normally contains the two mediastinal pleural reflections as well as a part of esophagus. So any pathology involving these structures can give rise to opacity here. For example, uh, you can see the tracheal malignancy can invade here, give an opacity, and you can see the esophagus here. Any esophageal lesions, malignancies, or any duplication congenital cyst can give a opacity here, or it can be due to pathology of the blood vessels, like a double iota or aberrant vessels. These are, can also bring out opacity here. So these are the few things that can cause pathology here. So it's important to look at radius triangle too. Finally, about a sign, which is known as the spine sign. So if you look carefully in a normal lateral chest radiograph, the lucency increases as you go down. That is in the upper side, you can see that it is more hazy and more white whereas lower down the spine if you trace you can find it to be more loosened this is the normal pattern why is it so so if you were to take the positioning in chest radiograph we know that in the upper part there is lots of soft tissue so more of the x-ray beam gets attenuated attenuated or stopped so less is recorded here so it appears more radio opaque whereas more going down you can see that there is less of soft tissue so so more of the x-ray beams are reaching here so it would be more radio loosened so this is one of the explanation for the sign so this is the normal pattern so if you find reversal of the same for example if you find more opacity here it means that there is some lesion located here let's say any consolidation or lung mass lesion so summarizing we have seen the normal anatomical structures that is ranging from airways to blood vessels the bony cage the cardia diaphragm and the fissures and we have to always remember regarding the position of the hilar vessel sandwiching the air column, the right pulmonary artery being anterior and the left pulmonary artery being posterior. And finally, never forget to look for the three dark areas and one sign. The three dark areas being the retrosternal, the retrocardiac and the retrotracheal or the radar triangle and also looking for the spine sign where as you go down the lung fields must be more loosened so friends i hope this lecture on lateral chest radiograph was helpful to you i'll be coming up with the next video shortly thank you